How many of you are excited that it's Christmas time? Wow, I think the rest of you are excited about Easter, I guess. <laughs> I'm sure you'll agree with me that Christmas time uh, is the best season of the year, yes? Have you wondered why the birth of Christ is called Christmas? Or why we as believers of Jesus Christ are called Christians? What's so significant of the title Christ? If each one of you were asked who or what is the best part of Christmas, what is the first thing that will pop up in your mind? I'll repeat my question. If you were asked who or what is the best part of Christmas, what is the first thing that will pop up in your mind? I just came here, Christ, okay. Maybe some of you thought gifts, uh, meeting and, um, you know, having a time of celebration with family, uh, fellowship with friends at church. Some of you who love food must have thought food or cakes or holidays, Christmas plays and programs. Or some of you who love shopping must have thought the first thing would have popped up in your mind would have been shopping. But I'm glad some of you, I heard some of you saying Christ. Well, Christ is the best part of Christmas. Our Christmases are filled with uh, food, gifts, programs, shopping, cooking, and family get-togethers. And often it looks like a birthday celebration where family and friends are gathered, uh, there's noise of talking and laughter in the room. There's an aroma of delicious food in the air, the cake on the table. But the person whose birthday we've all met to gather and celebrate is missing. Have you been part of such a birthday party? If you have been, then you must have experienced uneasiness or sadness, something amiss or an incomplete feeling. At that first Christmas, they celebrated the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus was at the center of that first Christmas. Let's look at what they experienced. When Mary and Joseph must have looked at that lovely baby Jesus, they must have experienced a sense of divine accomplishment and great joy. The angel who announced the birth of the Savior to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2 verse 10, we read, the angel said, I bring you good tidings of great joy. I'm sure the angel was excited and overjoyed to publish the news of the birth of the Son of God. After the angel gave the message to the shepherds, there was a multitude of heavenly hosts we are praising God that God's plan of redemption had unfolded. When the shepherds were returning back after seeing the Savior who is Christ their Lord, they were glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard as we read in Luke chapter 2 verse 20. The wise men who were in pursuit of finding the king when they found him must have experienced great joy, sense of fulfillment and excitement, contentment that they had found this king that they were looking for. And they presented their gifts and they bowed down and worshipped him. Now why was there so much of joy and excitement and wonder and awe? and a sense of fulfillment and celebration and worship, praise and adoration among men and heavenly hosts. Now over the course of the Old Testament and the period leading to the birth of Jesus, there arose an expectation that there would be someone to come in the future, a Messiah that would fulfill all the Old Testament promises. The people of Israel were looking for a Messiah a political king, a ruler, who would save, redeem, and give them freedom from political, from the oppression and the political tyranny of the Roman rule. Now, how do the people know 
that Jesus was the Messiah that they were looking for. We read in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the angel in a dream told Joseph that Mary will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In Luke chapter 2, verse 11, the angels announced to the shepherds that there is born to you this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. And in Matthew chapter 2, verse 4, when Herod heard from the wise men that the king was born, Herod inquired of the chief priests and the scribes where the Christ was to be born. Now coming back to my question, what is so significant of the title Christ? What is so significant about the title Christ? Now Christ is not just the second or the last name of Jesus. It's a highly significant title that is given to Jesus throughout the scriptures. In fact, it's a title that Jesus gladly accepted as divinely inspired by God when Peter confessed that you are the Christ, the son of the living God in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 18. Now, what does Christ mean? The equivalent Greek word for Christ is Christos, meaning anointed. That is the Messiah, a description of Jesus as the anointed one. And Christos is derived from the Greek word Kyrio. And Kyrio means to smear or rub with oil. That is to consecrate to an office or a religious service. Now, the Greek word Christ only appears in the New Testament because the New Testament is written in Greek and it does not appear in the Old Testament because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. But the word anointed in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, means Moshiha. In all instances, this word Moshiha appears in the Old Testament, it's translated as anointed. And it basically refers to a person who is consecrated or anointed as a king, a priest, or a prophet. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 9, 11, 16, and 23, when David is referring to King Saul as God's Moshiha. That means God's anointed. In Leviticus chapter 4, verses 3, 5, and 16, the Levitical priests were called as Moshiha. That means were called as anointed. And in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, King Cyrus, the Persian king, was also called Moshiha. That means God's anointed. Now, in the New Testament, the word Christ always is referred to Jesus. Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Christos, which means Jesus, the anointed one. On the other hand, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word Moshiha has not been exclusively referred to only Jesus. As I mentioned, it was also referred to King Saul, to the Levitical priests, and to King Cyrus. But there are two verses in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 and 26, where we find this word, Moshiha, but instead of being translated as anointed, there it's translated as the Messiah. Only in these two verses in the Old Testament does this word Moshiha is translated as the Messiah or Savior. And this is referring to the anointed one, Jesus, our Messiah. So what am I trying to say? The word anointed or the meaning of the word Christ is just not a Savior, is just not Messiah, deliverer or redeemer, but the word Christ means 
the anointed one. And we read in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, where it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We see here that Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit in the beginning of his ministry. But what was he anointed as? As I had mentioned, in the Old Testament, there were three offices that were traditionally anointed with oil as a symbol of divine appointment. And these three offices include the prophet, the priests, and the kings. For example, when Saul was the first king of Israel, Samuel the prophet came and anointed his head with oil in a very ceremonial fashion. And this religious ritual or this religious rite was performed to show that the king of Israel was chosen and endowed for kingship by God himself. Likewise, the priests that we read in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 41, the prophets in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 16, were anointed at God's command. Jesus, the anointed one, fulfilled all the three roles of the prophet, the priest, and the king perfectly. Let's look at how Jesus ministered or how Jesus fulfilled these roles perfectly. The first thing we look at is Jesus the prophet. We read in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 that God at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Throughout the ages, God spoke to the prophets. He spoke words of comfort. He spoke words of correction. He spoke words of instruction. He spoke words of warning to the people. But there was no one in the prophetic office who was greater than the prophet Moses. But during Moses' prophetic ministry, he made a very peculiar promise that stuck with the people of Israel all the way up till the birth of Jesus. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses tells the people, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Now hundreds of years had passed by and Israel, the Israelites had never seen a prophet who was like Moses. You know, they saw prophets like Isaiah, the Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the likes of them, the rest of them. But there was, in a sense, they were still looking forward for the coming of this prophet who would be like Moses, who Moses spoke about. Now, when Jesus appeared, and when Jesus taught, he taught in ways that no one had ever taught before. Most of the prophets began their prophetic message. How did the, most of the prophets begin their prophetic message? Yes, they spoke and said, thus says the Lord. See, but when Jesus came, he spoke and he just said it. He said it as one having divine authority. He said it as if he himself was the Lord. And the crowds immediately recognized that there was something different about Jesus' teaching. There was something different in the way Jesus thought. There was something different in the way Jesus said things. And that is why we see in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29, when Jesus ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So they knew Jesus was quite different from the scribes. 
And furthermore, we see that, you know, Moses had done incredible things when he was in his prophetic ministry. He parted the Red Sea. There was raining of food from heaven. But when Jesus came, he just didn't part the seas or the waters. He walked on it. He spoke to the wind and the waves, and they just obeyed him. He multiplied the five loaves and two fishes, and he fed the thousands. And naturally, people were wondering whether this could be the prophet that was promised by Moses. We read in John chapter 7, verse 40 and 41, it says, Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard the saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. This is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. Now, Jesus was different from all the prophets who ever lived. And how was he different? He was not just a prophet, but he was God as prophet. Jesus was different from all the other prophets. He was not just a prophet chosen by God, but he was God as prophet. In the case of Jesus, God did not send someone to speak on his behalf. But in the case of Jesus, it was God himself, God becoming man, who spoke the very words of God with unique authority. He was the word that became flesh. And that is what we read in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. As a prophet, Jesus represented God to man. As a prophet, Jesus represented who God was to man. Now, if Christ, the anointed one, is the center of your celebration at Christmas, then we need to spend time reading and meditating on this word that became flesh. Not just reading and meditating his word, but abiding in his word. We need to obey his word. Colossians 3 verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So if Christ has to be the center of your Christmas celebration, then we need to share the good news of the word that became flesh at Christmas time. Spend time worshiping this word. Spend time worshiping this word that became flesh, adoring him with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Let's see how Jesus fulfilled perfectly the role as Christ, the anointed one, as a priest. Now, if Jesus was just a prophet, then Christmas would not be just worth celebrating. It's not enough for us just to know more about God or more about his word. The problem with humanity is that even though we know more about God or exactly what he has instructed us in his word, we rebel against him. So we need more than just somebody to tell us that we are sinners. We need somebody to take away our sin. In the Old Testament, there was an awareness of the separation that sin had caused between God and man. So God ordained a ceremonial system of offering sacrifices by which people's sins would be covered. And God ordained priests, the anointed ones, who would offer sacrifices on behalf of themselves and the people. So when Jesus came as the anointed priest, he was far greater than all the priests who were part of this, of this priestly office because he did not offer any animal sacrifice, but he offered himself as that full, sufficient, perfect, 
unblemished sacrifice, the unblemished lamb of God of eternal worth. And after he made that full sufficient and perfect sacrifice, he now, as our great high priest, has entered the Holy of Holies. I'm not talking about the Holy of Holies, that is the earthly tabernacle or the earthly tent of meeting or the earthly church, but I'm talking about heaven. He, does, he just does not enter the Holy of Holies as the priests used to do once in a year. But the word says that he is there forevermore now as our great high priest. We read in Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 and 12, but Christ came as a high priest of good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 and 24 says, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. As our great high priest, Jesus represents the people to God. He just does not represent his people to God, but he lives forevermore. He's there in heaven, interceding for us, interceding for the forgiveness of our sins, interceding for our needs, interceding for, our, for uh, the grace that we require, interceding for the help that we require forever. And he lives forever to make intercession for us. Romans chapter 8 verse 34 says, Christ who died furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So we see that Jesus is there in heaven, not just sitting and enjoying the angelic worship, but he lives forevermore to make intercession for us. In Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, Therefore, he is also able to save the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. And Jesus, as our great high priest, he understands, he knows our weaknesses and he helps us. As Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us the time of need. During Christmas, are we celebrating what Jesus did for us on the cross? Are we celebrating the sin, the shame, the curse, the bondage, the oppression, the sickness that he took upon himself on the cross. Are we celebrating life? Are we celebrating freedom from sin? Are we celebrating freedom from every oppressive and depressive spirit? Are we celebrating freedom from every sickness, from every ailment that plagues us, that pulls us down? Because that is what Jesus came to do for us. As the anointed priest, he made that full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. And he lives forever, interceding on behalf of us. And what he purchased for us on the cross is still available for each one of you even today. Are you thankful this Christmas season that Jesus took your sin? That he took your punishment? Are you aware or are we aware of the sin that is still present in our lives that plagues us? Are we asking him for his mercy and his grace to overcome our sin, our sinful attitudes? Christ will truly be the center of our Christmas when we come to this place, when we are able to confess our sins and ask him for his forgiveness and live in freedom from every power and bondage of sin that rules us, that overcomes us. As a prophet, Jesus, the anointed one, represents God to the people. 
as a priest, Jesus, the anointed one, represents people to God. And the last one, as a king, Jesus, the anointed one, initiated the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Christ the king. God promised that one day there would be someone in the line of King David who would sit on the throne eternally and rule over a never-ending kingdom. And we read in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, he will be great and will be called the son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. On that Christmas day, the kingdom had come because the king had arrived. Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And this kingdom that he ushered in still waits its completion. Because Jesus is coming soon. And when he comes soon, his kingdom will be completed. There will be no more curse of sin, no more war, no more death, no sorrow, no pain, no suffering, no sickness, no crying. There will be no more the curse of sin and no more the separation of man from God. It will be a kingdom only for those who repent of building their own little kingdoms. I'll repeat that again. It will be a kingdom only for those who repent of building their own little kingdoms and who turn and trust and put their faith in Jesus Christ as their new and eternal king. If Jesus was this Messiah, if Jesus was this Christ, if Jesus was this anointed one, then why didn't the people not recognize him? Or why did the people not accept him? If they knew this was this Messiah, if they knew this was the anointed one, if they knew this was the Christ, then why did they not accept him? Why did they reject him? Why did they not uh, accept his kingdom and his rule? Now, as I said, the Israelites were looking for a political messiah. They were looking for a ruler who will fight a war for them, who will give them freedom, who will give them deliverance, redemption, who will bring in prosperity, who will bring in peace and freedom. But they could not accept Jesus as he is and who he claimed to be as the Lord and as the Christ. They were not willing to accept someone who was this light that exposed their sin. They did not wish to submit to his lordship. Instead, they wanted him to do what they wanted him to do, and they wanted him to be who they wanted him to be, a political ruler, a political king. And they also never wished to come to him as unworthy sinners seeking his grace. It's very easy for each one of us to accept this nice, sweet Savior who forgives our sins, who assures us of a place in eternity in heaven, a place in heaven, one who blesses us and helps us to be happy. But at the same time, it's very difficult for us to accept this Christ as Lord over our lives. It's very difficult for us to submit and surrender every area of our lives and let him be the king. Let him be the ruler. Let him take the lordship over every area of our lives. And if you find it difficult to submit to his lordship and only accept him as that sweet savior who forgives our sins and you're very happy with it, Actually, our salvation is not complete. Our salvation is complete only when we accept him both as Savior and as Lord. Lord 
who rules our lives. Lord, who is the king over our lives. Lord, who we submit all of our areas to him. Becky Pippert, in her book, Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World, tells us of inviting Lois, a Stanford student, who was, skeptical, who was skeptical about the existence of God, to a Bible study. Lois agreed to come, but said, the Bible will not have anything relevant to say to me. The next day, Becky discovered that Lois was living off campus with her boyfriend, Phil. To Becky's great surprise, Phil came with Lois to the Bible study. Now, before Becky knew about Lois' background, she had already decided and prepared that for the Bible study, she would be talking about the Samaritan woman or Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. And during the study, they began the study uh, by each one of them reading a portion of that passage. And Lois had to read the portion where Jesus said to the woman, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for the man you're living with now is not your husband. And when Lois read this, she was taken back with surprise. She knew that the Bible had something relevant to say to her. Becky later met with Lois and talked about her commitment with Christ her Lord. And she directly spoke about how becoming a Christian is a relationship of total commitment with God that affects all of our areas, including our morals. As they talked, it became very clear that God has actually been pursuing Lois for a long time now. And finally, there were tears and struggles followed by a sincere prayer asking Christ to be her Savior and Lord. But after Lois prayed this prayer, she told Becky, Becky, I've got problems. I have to tell Phil now that I made a commitment to Jesus and I have to move out of that house. And she says, it's impossible for me to get a dorm room now and if I have to get another house, then I'll be paying two rents this month. You know, Loy, uh, Becky prayed with her about the situation. And as Lois left, Becky was wondering how this young believer would handle such a situation now. How this young believer will have to handle so much now. Later, as Becky was chatting in the hall with a couple of young girls, a couple of young students, she heard a commotion and they all turned to see Lois slowly walking down the corridor, carrying a lot of suitcases in her hands, with a smile on her face and tears rolling down her cheeks. And everyone began asking her, Lois, why did you leave home? She said, I haven't left home. I finally found my home. You see, today I became a Christian. Now, that decision had far-reaching effects on so many of them who witnessed that scene. That same night, three girls decided to get right with Christ. Another girl who assumed that she was a Christian realized that she wanted no part of it which demanded total commitment. And here was this young girl whom finally made that total commitment to Christ and realized that making that commitment to Christ was not just accepting him as a savior, but also making him Lord over her life. The next day, Lois got a room in the dormitory and she discovered that her new roommate was a mature Christian. Three months later, her boyfriend Phil became a Christian and he grew rapidly. He had been angry over Lois' conversion and her moving out. But after he was converted, he told her, thanks, Lois, for loving God enough to put him first instead of me. Your obedience affected my eternal destiny. Your obedience affected 
my eternal destiny. If Christ has to be the center of Christmas, then Christ has to be the center of each one of us as Christians. The word Christian comes from the Greek word Christianos. And it is the same word that originates of the Greek word Christ, which means Kyrios. So what does a Christian mean? A Christian just means a follower of Christ. Someone who's not just following Christ, but someone who's acting like Christ. Someone who emulates the anointed one. Someone who emulates the anointed one. So we as Christians are the anointed ones because we are, you know, in First Peter it says that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. See, and that is the calling, that is the position that Jesus has given to us. Just like Jesus was the anointed one, each one of us are also anointed ones. And as prophets, let's emulate the anointed one by truly representing God to the people. As prophets, as each one of us are prophets, let's emulate the anointed one by truly representing God to man. So when people at your workplace, people at your, in your colleges, people in, in your school, uh, your friends at school, your neighbors, when they look at you, we need to represent Christ to them. And how can we do this? Let us share the word, let us live by the word, and let us obey the word. As priests, let us emulate the anointed one by representing the people to God. Let us live our lives victorious over sin and the power of sin, thus leading people to God. Let us intercede for the lost souls so they too can know the Christ of Christmas. Because we as priests, we stand as these earthly priests, just like our, our, our heavenly priests, our great high priest is interceding on behalf of us. Let us as priests who are called the anointed ones, let us emulate the anointed one by interceding for the lost souls this Christmas, that they too will know the Christ of Christmas. And as king, let us emulate his lordship seen over every area of our lives. Let his lordship be seen in every area of our lives. Let his lordship be seen in our relationships. Let his lordship be seen in our business deals. Let his lordship be seen in the way we interact with people, in the way we talk about people, in the way we, um, uh, we love people, in the way we respect people. Let his lordship be seen in our moral values, in the way we live our lives with integrity, with moral uprightness, and with holiness. Let's just close our eyes in prayer. Even as Jesus, the anointed one, fulfill the role of a priest, a prophet, and a king. And he has called us. He's called each one of us. He's given us the grace, the mercy, the help that we need to represent him, to be his anointed ones here on earth. Maybe this morning you've accepted Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior. Maybe you've accepted him as your Savior. 
You've asked him to forgive your sins. You've confessed your sins to him. You've repented. But maybe you've not accepted him as Lord over your lives. You've not given him the lordship over every area of your life. This morning, the Christ of Christmas is not just interested in being your savior, but he also wants to be your, your king, your Lord. Would you like him to be the Lord of your life? Lord over your relationships. Lord over your business deals. Lord over your, your work at your workplace. Lord over your finances. Lord over your moral values, your ethical values. Are you willing to make him the center of your life? If you are, you can just say, Lord Jesus, I accept you, not just as Savior, but as Lord. Come take complete control of my life. Be Lord of my life. Be Lord of what I think. Be Lord of what I speak. Be Lord of what I do. Be Lord over my relationships, my family. Be Lord over my business. Be Lord over my work. Be Lord over my studies. If you have compromised in any way, just say, God, I've made those compromises. I ask you for forgiveness this morning. Forgiveness for every sin that I overlooked, every compromise that I made. Everything I gave myself into, everything of this world that I've accepted, that I've lived in, that has let it rule over my life. Say, God, this morning, I just let go of all of those things, God. I shut all of those doors. Things that I've opened to this world, I shut it in the name of Jesus. God, I just seek, seek to do your will, seek to obey your word at all times, God, in all situations, in everything that I watch, in everything that I think, in everything that I say, God, in everything that I do, God. Be Lord, be King. Come rule my life, God. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior this morning, do you want to invite him as your Savior? If you're willing to do that, just say, God, I'm frustrated in my life. My sins have taken a toll over me. I'm living, God, in, in utter frustration, in hopelessness. I don't see any lights, but this morning, I know that you came as a light in this world. You are the light of this world, God. You are my light. You are my hope. You are my salvation. You are my redeemer. You are my savior. You are my Messiah, God. And I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive all of my sins. Cleanse me and wash me. And be my savior. You can also pray and ask God to be the Lord of your life. Just say, Lord, I give and submit my life to you. I accept your lordship. I accept your rule. I accept your reign in my life, God, this morning.
come take control of my life. Be Lord of my life, God. I thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. We raise a hallelujah, Father, this morning. To you for your great are your works, God. We thank you for sending us your son. The anointed one. The Messiah. Who has redeemed us, who has delivered us. Who has ushered in, ushered each one of us into your kingdom, God. Who has called us as your priests, as your prophets, as your heirs, God. Oh, we just thank you this morning, Father. Oh, we just thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the great price that you paid for us. We thank you for the great works that you have done, God. We thank you, God. We bless your holy name, Father. We give you all glory and honor and praise, God, for who you are to us, God. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, that you are our word, Father. Your word gives us life. Your word gives us hope. Your word gives us encouragement. Your word gives us strength and healing, God. And we thank you for the word that became flesh, that came and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory and we see his glory. And we live in his glory and we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for being our great high priest. For making that full sufficient, perfect sacrifice for us. And who is at right now in heaven interceding for us. Oh, interceding that we may receive grace and mercy in our time of need. We thank you. We thank you, great high priest. We love you. We thank you, King. We thank you for your kingdom. That we are part of your kingdom, God. That we are stewards of your kingdom. We are heirs of your kingdom. That you have given us the keys of authority over your kingdom, God. And even as you have done that to us, God, we pray that we will be people who will rightly, God, use that authority to build your kingdom, God. This morning, if any of you are facing storms in your life, just raise a hallelujah to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He's the Lord over the storm. He's a God who can speak to that storm and quieten it right now. He's a God who can remove those dark clouds and bring in the sunshine and the hope and the peace. Right now, we just pray in the mighty name of Jesus that his peace would overflow and flood your heart. The peace of God that passes all understanding will rule and guard your heart and your mind in the name of Jesus. If any one of you are being dealing wrongly in your business, God is calling, or God is saying that He wants to be Lord over your business. He's just telling you, trust in me. Don't compromise. Don't let go. Don't think twice. Just trust in me. Because I am the God who can change your situations. I am the God of miracles. Maybe people are walking out. Maybe you have to do things to compromise to save your business. But God is saying this morning, just trust in me. Just trust in me. Trust in me to save it. Trust in me to give you what is rightfully yours. Trust in me to build. Just let it go. Let it go into my hands. We thank you, God. We thank you, Jesus. We bless you this morning. 
give you glory and honor and praise in this place God we pray that even as we celebrate Christmas that we will truly celebrate it in the meaning that you brought for us God we bless you we thank you in Jesus name we pray Amen Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.